Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rebecca Ray. I'm a senior researcher here at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, or as we like to call it, the GDP Center. Welcome to this panel discussion on designing a green Marshall Plan, guidelines for the Build Back Better Partnership. Our discussion is co-sponsored by the BU GDP Center and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development, UNCTAD. Before we get started, I'd like to let you know that we're recording today's session and it'll be available for review on our YouTube channel. So if one of our panelists makes a point that you'd like to hear again and you'd just like to review it, you can find us there. Today's webinar will be structured like a panel discussion with each of the panelists beginning with brief remarks of five to seven minutes and a discussion and question and answer session afterwards. You can add your questions by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. So please feel free to add to the discussion and the Q&A session by doing that. We'd like to have as rich of a discussion as possible, but unfortunately we can't see all of your beautiful faces. So when you add a question, please include your name and institution so our panelists know who they're talking with. We'll get through as many questions as we can in the time that we have. Uh, and again, please be aware that we are being recorded. And now let's turn to today's topic, a green Marshall Plan. UNCTAD has called for a new Marshall Plan on two fronts. In their most recent trade and development report, they called for a health Marshall Plan of 0.7% of world GDP annually, or about $500 billion in grants and zero interest loans just to recover from the current COVID-19 pandemic. They've also called for a UN Economic Reconstruction and Economic Reform Summit to chart a path for post-pandemic rebuilding and for building new resilience into the global economy so that future crises are more manageable. Meanwhile, the G20 Foundation's platform has estimated that the world needs a whopping 2.2% of GDP invested annually to deliver on the 2030 sustainable, sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement, about $800 billion a year just for low-income countries. Well, China's Belt and Road Initiative rivals these calls, at least in size. Our own research has tracked over 400 billion in new Chinese finance commitments across the world in a variety of sectors since the last, last global economic peak in 2008 about as much as the World Bank and much more than any other bilateral credit creditor in that time period. It's brought significant benefits to participating countries with the World Bank's Belt and Road Economics Report estimating an increase in world GDP of 2.9% because of the BRI and for participating countries, 3.4%. But as we've noted in our work that you may have seen on the subject, it also brings significant risks on social, environmental and economic fronts. Well, this year has seen renewed calls for greater development aid, finance, and investments from other major global powers. At this year's G7 meeting, leaders reiterated their commitment to $100 billion per year in global climate financing alone. And now Biden has proposed the B3W plan, or Building Back Better for the World, planning a whopping $40 trillion in sustainable infrastructure. But rather than aid or sovereign loans, it promises to rely mostly on channeling private investment and holding that investment to high environmental, social, and transparency standards. Well, today, we have the opportunity to hear from three experts in global finance, investment, and sustainability on these plans and their prospects for delivering on this very ambitious but very necessary vision. First, we'll get to hear from Salim Fakir, Executive Director of the Africa Climate Foundation. Salim is a prolific writer on climate finance. If you follow South African press, you will have seen him frequently quoted in the Daily Maverick and other news outlets on South Africa's potential for green energy transitions. Salim has an MA in Environmental Science and Management from Y College London, and before founding the Africa Climate Foundation, he served as the head of the Policy and Futures Unit of WWF South Africa. And he was the associate director for the Center for Renewable and Sustainable Energy at Stellenbosch University. He'll be followed by the GDP Center's own Cecilia Han Springer, senior researcher and expert on climate and energy. You may be familiar with her work through our China's global power data set that she worked so diligently on and introduced a few months ago. Her interdisciplinary focus is on environmental impacts of China's overseas investment policymaking processes within China and industrial decarbonization. She earned her MS and PhD from the Energy and Resources Group at the University of California, Berkeley. 
We were fortunate enough to have her join our team after her time as a postdoctoral fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. And finally, we'll hear from Jayati Ghosh, Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I've been following her work for many years from her decades of teaching at JNU in New Delhi, India. She's recently become a neighbor by joining the faculty at my own alma mater, UMass Amherst. You may have seen her recent article in Project Syndicate on a multicolored New Deal, incorporating more than just green. Her research and writing is required reading or should be up for anyone wishing a solid understanding of development economics, gender and sustainability in practice, not just in theory. Unfortunately, one of our panelists we announced for the event, Daniela Gabor, will be unable to join us today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Salim Fakir. Please go ahead, Salim. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's a real pleasure to, to be invited to, to speak at at this event and uh, I thought I'll make a few remarks and hopefully I'll stick to time. Uh, there wasn't any much detail of, uh, around the Green Marshall Plan. I've looked at uh, you know, several statements, etc. cetera, but uh, maybe uh, I will be inventive and creative in thinking through what the uh, sort of uh, challenges are uh, and, and what the kinds of issues are that we, we may want to look at. <clears throat> so, uh, I am generally a skeptic of grand plans, uh, given the complexities of individual countries, their nuances, and the dynamics of the, the individual political economies. And I, I want to emphasize political economies are very important, and you will see why this matters when you're dealing with coal, gas, and oil, uh, and particularly uh, commodity-dependent countries. Uh, uh, and But political economies are both... Uh, sources of opportunity, and they are also uh, uh, sources of friction, depending on how much alignment there is between uh, different competing interests uh, in the national uh, context uh, in order to be able to uh, pull off, uh, even at the national level, green stimulus, uh, uh, green growth, uh, whatever the, the label one wants to give. But uh, let's say uh, the pursuant of uh, important uh, de inclusive development agenda, even if it's under the label of green. The world does need a Marshall Plan to solve underdevelopment and inequality, but how does one do that with contradictions in such a world where the forms of support and cooperation by no means are unified on how to solve universal basic needs against what is still a zero-sum game of national interests, which are playing out uh, as we as we think about these issues today. And they're far more deeper today than they were 10 years ago when uh, Fukuyama declared uh, you know, the end of history. We are in a completely different world. We are not uh, dealing with necessary uh, universal aspirations uh, that are based on uh, liberal uh, international order and liberal values. In fact, they're co contesting uh, values and suppositions about even the notion of development for that matter. So in being a skeptic, I do recognize we need to take this challenge up. Uh, perhaps I'm in, inspired by the work of uh, Mariana Mazakuto, whose recent book is called For Us to Think Big and not to be intimidated by the size of the challenge, uh, but to be able to rally around some of these complex challenges like climate change, which is a wicked problem. Uh, in the case of my foundation, uh, when we look at climate change issues, we do not divorce it from, develop, from the development nexus. And we actually argue it's not feasible to talk about the normal con uh, uh, sort of uh, balance of uh, climate change that is in the Paris process or anywhere else uh, without embedding it in a strong ethos of a developmental agenda on, on the African continent. So. Uh, in one hand, I go along with Mazakuto's idea of thinking grand, having moonshot ideas and mission oriented work. Uh, but there's also the realist in me that recognizes that we do not have a seamless uh, process of um, uh, bringing together a coalition of countries and, and players uh, to be able to build uh, a common agenda around whether it's called a Green Marshall Plan the Great Green New Deal, or whatever the idea is that we have. 
So having raised your hopes, let me return to the reasons for my skepticism, uh, but uh, a healthy one at that, and I hope it will inject uh, some fire in this discussion. The Build Back Better Partnership, B3W, takes place in a context in, we, in, the U, in which the US has to catch up with geopolitical rivals like Europe and China. And that's largely because of uh, what one may call four sad, four sad years with Trump. Uh, this, uh, even internally within uh, the US, uh, the idea of the build back, better, build back Better notion still needs to be settled between the Republicans and the Democrats. It's not by any means solved. So even for the US to leap uh, with $40 trillion worth of private funding, funding um, uh, is a tall order uh, given the, the frictions uh, given within the US. So everything at the G7 involved mostly a repositioning of the G7, which was in tatters, uh, given the four sad years that I just mentioned. And it itself is frictured. And we could see that uh, even as Biden push for very strong uh, uh, push against China, for that matter, not everybody on the G7 was on board on the anti-China wave, as you may call it. And really the B3W was cast as an alternative to the BRI. I think the Chinese are not gonna call it anymore the BRI, but we will see uh, uh, given, the, uh, given what's going on at the moment. Uh, this picture has to be included in what I suggest is a challenge of glo global alignment versus global friction. Uh, when we think of the Green Marshall Plan, these two frameworks, the B3W and the BRI will involve a race for influence, uh, to expand the spheres of influence of the two, geo, largely two geopolitical rivals, uh, consecrating specific types of di digital infrastructure along the lines of their own um, uh, technological uh, uh, march in, in, in pursuing the frontiers of both uh, uh, 5G, artificial intelligence, et cetera, and uh, ensuring security of lanes of supply for critical movement of ideas and goods, including these critical minerals that are essential uh, to bring about the Green Marshall Plan. And we should not underestimate the nature of this competition, uh, this rivalry, and the consequences this will have for developing countries, which have always had to fit into one or the other sphere uh, or more uh, of this um, uh, uh, sort of new cold war, a cold uh, war, if you want. But you cannot talk of a Green Marshall Plan as if it's an innocent disposition, a, a, a political project, as development in emerging and developing countries requires counter cyclical remedies, ambitious stimulus built around a clean infrastructure push, and revolution, which will require aligned resources of finance, access to technology, trade policy the power of which many of these countries uh, do not have in their ability to set because it's largely framed by the interests of dominant powers. Many of these technology options are a source of rival in attack, uh, as, as we see, for example, with renewables, 5G uh, technology, semiconductors. It's all spilling over into access to critical minerals and access to markets. And uh, clearly, uh, Africa is in, in, in the middle of that in terms of its... Uh, very rich endowments with rare earths, copper, and many critical minerals for the next modernity, which is really what we're talking about. And if anything, that's what should the Green Marshall Plan should be. So Africa sits in a very awkward and dynamic geopolitical environment. It is at a historical juncture in itself. The economies of Africa have to revisit the entire models of growth and development, given the post-COVID period, especially commodity uh, dependent countries, oil and uh, gas countries, which in the, in the broader context of Africa contribute about 40% of exports to the African economy. So this is an opportune time for a sort of Green Marshall Plan for Africa, which is the highest percentage of poor and least developed countries in the world, and will continue to do so if nothing is done about these, uh, these challenges. And in the future, 17 to 18% of the world's population will be in Africa, and most likely the poorest, if nothing has changed. Um, I, I want to say it's natural resources are critical to the Green Revolution and the net zero ambition, but it's likely to be the most affected by uh, 
this push for the green revolution and the net zero ambition, uh, if the green deal goes ahead with its carbon water tax adjustments as planned, it will affect, uh, could have negative consequences uh, for Africa and will take off the agenda all of the blah, blah about Africa's development if the green deal, for example, becomes a new form of uh, strategic autonomy, well, it is a st form of strategic auto autonomy for Europe, in which Europe's interests are put first, and then everybody else has to follow that. So uh, there is both great uh, opportunity and threat. Africa has to revisit the nature of climate diplomacy, that has to go beyond the usual, frankly, uninventive, boring, and if not tiresome cocktail of the Paris process. Paris has its value, uh, but it it is, the world is moving beyond Paris. Not everything happens at Paris, and you will see that increasingly the, to be the case. Uh, uh, um, but it's, it's an important process to pre, uh, preserve as a multilateral process because it is one of the few avenues for developing countries to have some level of uh, equality in voice and ability to, to cast, if you want, uh, a no vote on something they don't, don't like. But it is not powerful enough uh, because a lot of things happen outside of there. So climate issues are no longer just an environmental concern. They are already deeply about geopolitical and trade issues. Economic reform and dramatic shifts are critical within African economies. If they are to move out of a commodity dependency and gathering of Africa's future economic prospects, largely dictated by large powers that have fostered particular types of trade relations uh, with Africa. So if the Green Marshall Plan doesn't address this, we are going to continue to perpetuate. We are going to move to new types of minerals uh, dependency, which are the critical minerals, uh, which are necessary for the new modernity. modernity. The Paris process is ill-equipped to deal with Africa's needs for its own Marshall Plan. In many respects, Paris's particularly finance solutions are no longer fit for purpose, given that effectively a Green Marshall Plan is already happening in the EU under the Green Deal and China's own carbon neutral uh, uh, neutrality by 2060, uh, uh, 2060 is beginning to shape major structural shifts in these economies, uh, uh, incentivizing new waves of technology. And all they have to do now is to push out this into new markets, which is effectively what the strategy is, but take what they need uh, to establish this. So, so I'm they are not about. I need, I'm afraid last, I need to cut last, you off there. Okay. Okay. No, okay. No problem. Uh, let me just say one last word. Uh, so a lot of the uh, what we're seeing uh, is not about uh, it's uh, about the rest of the world, nor Africa, but rather being able to position their economies. I'm talking about these large powers to reap the most out of new type of trade frameworks, set of standards, and technology revolution. Thank you. Thank you so much, Salim. I'm sorry for having to cut you off there. I want to make sure that we have enough time for, for everyone else at the Q&A. Uh, so I'll turn now to Cecilia, who I think may have some visuals to share with us. So please take it away, Cecilia. Yes, I am sharing my screen now. And oops, can you all see the slides? Perfectly. Great. Um, well, today um, I want to talk about lessons from China's Belt and Road Initiative for um, BQW and a Green Marshall Plan. Um, and so uh, Salim talked a little bit about the perspective uh, from Africa, as well as um, some of the nature of the competition between uh, the West and China uh, for global infrastructure development. So I may be presenting perhaps a more optimistic view, but I hope that um, through sharing some of the empirical evidence that we've gathered at the GDP Center and that other researchers have compiled, I can um, convince you uh, that China um, should uh, be parallel to any Western-led uh, Green Marshall Plan um, and that Given that China's outward finance and investment over the past few decades through the BRI, as well as the earlier going out policy and the economic corridors and uh, many other trends over time, um, that because it is the biggest infrastructure in initiative since the Marshall Plan, um, that any uh, parallel effort from the West should not be necessarily antagonistic or um, 
uh, competitive in a negative way. I think, you know, we've heard the words Cold War, um, but that there should be something um, that's more along the same track. And so the BRI should be credited for mobilizing an increase in global development finance that is filling infrastructure gaps and spurring economic growth uh, in developing countries. Um, at the same time, though, there have been significant uh, sustainability risks. These are not unique to the BRI. These have been uh, issues for Western finance in its earlier stages, but the BRI has been associated with issues like debt distress, climate risk, and risk to biodiversity and indigenous lands. Um, but looking both at the benefits uh, from the BRI, as well as the risks that it's faced, um, the point that I really want to drive home here, number three, is that there should be healthy competition uh, with China. There, a Western-led effort should not be against the BRI, um, but together, because that way the world's global development financing needs can be met in a low carbon and inclusive manner. Um, and so let me get into these three points in a little bit more detail. So first, um, evidence that the BRI has generated economic benefits for developing countries. So our research here has shown that China's overseas development finance, as Becky mentioned in the beginning, already matches the World Bank um, and what Western MDBs have dispersed over time in scale. Um, and this uh, graph here shows that uh, China's two uh, flagship policy banks have already matched the amount of financing to sovereign governments that the World Bank provided from 2008 to 2019. And here, as the graph shows, the energy financing of these institutions matches the financing provided by all the Western-backed multilateral development banks. Um, and you can explore this data in our China's Global Energy Finance Database. Um, and we've also seen um, from research done by Justin Ifulin and uh, Yan Wang, who's here at our center, that China's BRI has unlocked infrastructure bottlenecks um, in developing countries. Uh, additional research has shown that uh, in some cases, China's projects in Africa have facilitated uh, technological transfer um, in papers by Deborah Brodigam at the Seis Carey um, Research Institute. Um, and I don't want to be entirely uh, seeing the world through rose tinted glasses, you know, there have also been um, many uh, risks associated, uh, as well as impacts associated with China's overseas development finance. And so um, we've talked a little bit about uh, debt distress. Um, and so this figure shows um, the uh, global ex uh, exposure to Chinese debt. Um, and this is especially an issue uh, in the era of post-COVID recovery. So the pandemic has made foreign capital and hard currency scarce, um, building up sovereign debt in many countries that uh, are hosting Chinese projects. Um, and so uh, in addition to debt distress, uh, there's also climate risks. So both in terms of um, transition risk, so uh, certain types of projects that China is heavily invested in are not going to be compatible with the Paris Agreement going forward, um, especially coal. And a lot of our research here has shown that coal represents the largest share of China's overseas electric power capacity and as a risk of becoming a stranded asset over time. Um, and at the same time, there's also physical risks to these projects in other countries as climate change worsens um, through avenues like sea level rise, temperature change, and so on. And our fellow Xia Li has done a comparative look at facilities owned and operated by Chinese companies and other companies and found that Chinese companies are facing higher water stress, floods, and hurricane and typhoon risks across host countries compared with um, facilities owned and operated by non-Chinese companies. And then finally, the work that Becky leads here at the GDP Center in FAIR BRI has shown and demonstrated that there are major risks to biodiversity and indigenous lands associated with um, China's overseas development finance. So um, through encroachment on critical habitat and protected areas. So, um, and this graph shows, you know, that in comparison, again, to the World Bank, these, these risks are not necessarily unique to China's overseas finance. Um, and this chart is comparing China's development finance, which is in red, uh, to the World Bank, which is shown in gray, um, uh, on a metric of risk to biodiversity and indigenous land. And it shows that China has higher average risk per loan 
um, but the World Bank has greater maximum risk per loan. And so these are issues that both the West and China will need to manage, um, especially if there's going to be scale up through um, the B3W. And so just to uh, draw this together, um, so the multilateral banks and the West um, seeking to scale for the purposes of B3W have also long suffered this risk and reward balance. Um, and any B3W initiative should follow these principles uh, to ensure that a Western-led effort is enabling healthy competition towards collective ends rather than you know, Cold War. And so um, these principles are having a massive increase in scale. So um, you know, the Belt and Road Initiative is operating on the scale of trillions of dollars, whereas um, that will definitely need to be scaled up uh, a lot. Um, we've already shown that China has far outpaced the West in terms of dispersing um, development finance. So that will include recapitalization of existing development finance institutions and even the creation of new ones. Um, and a Western B3W will also need to provide rapid and low cost financing uh, in order to uh, match China. And that should be aligned with the SDGs, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement in order to meet collective goals that have been set around low carbon and inclusive development. Um, and then the B3W should also lead by example, um, and as I've been saying, work in parallel, again, due to um, collective uh, provision of public goods that um, all these countries are wanting to work towards. And so I'm hoping in the Q&A that we can discuss uh, some specific areas uh, that uh, the US and China can work together on. I am sure my panelists also, that my fellow panelists also have many ideas. Um, about uh, specific ideas, you know, one that I would want to highlight is these debt for nature swaps that the GDP Center has explored, identifying areas where countries uh, that are facing uh, debt, debt distress um, with China also have um, areas that can be conserved. Um, and so I encourage you to uh, explore our interactive uh, data tools online. As I mentioned, we have this um, opportunities for financial stability web app that you can look at, um, as well as some of our research. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Um, that was great, so much information. And again, I'd like to emphasize that all of this is being recorded and will be available for review on YouTube later, if anyone would like to revisit those links or any of the charts or graphs that she shared to get a number or a scale off of it. Uh, and now I'll turn to Jayati Ghosh to, to wrap it up. <laughs> Please go ahead, Jayati. Thank, thank you so much, Rebecca. And this has been absolutely fascinating. Cecilia, I'm so glad that you brought up all of the significant contributions and the role that China can play because it is so under discussed in all of these, in the broader discourse. I would also just like to remind people, you cannot think of any global challenge today without thinking of the role of China. For example, more than half of the vaccines that have been distributed globally have come from China. And this is never really discussed. So it's very, very important, the role that China has, is playing and will continue to play. Having said that, let me begin on a bit of a negative note. I don't think we're anywhere near a global Marshall Plan, whether from the G7 countries or the China uh, interventions in BRI. And let's begin by reminding ourselves what were the significant elements of a Marshall, the Marshall Plan, right? I think it was characterized by three very important features. Speed, it was very, very rapid, done very quickly over three, four years very generous. Generosity was a major element, more than half of the money. Well, first of all, it was very large in relation to the recipient countries. It's true it was confined to Western European countries. That was part of the whole Cold War thing. But relative to the economies of those countries, it was four to seven percent of GDP. Massive. And most of it was grants or very, very long term and low interest rate loans. Very little was in the form of anything resembling a moderately market interest rate. So it was very generous. And third, there was a big significance of redistribution. And I think that's, uh, uh, sorry, of uh, public spending. And that's absolutely essential. The importance of public spending, the fact that the US actively encouraged the European countries to use 
the money that they were receiving for public spending in infrastructure, for public spending in creating the conditions under which the private sector can operate. That was essential. And of course, like the New Deal itself, there was an emphasis on regulation of different markets and on redistribution. Now, given that context, I think what is really striking, the very fact that we can talk about these as new deals and Marshall Plan, et cetera, is really a, a, an indication of the global shrinking of vision and lack of ambition, which is remarkable because the challenges we face today are actually bigger, they're more significant. So this absence of admission of ambition is, I think it's going to be very costly for humanity, okay? Uh, let's face it, these innovations in private finance, public-private partnerships, et cetera, are not going to cut it. They're not going to deliver. These tiny little additional investments that are being proposed even by the Biden government, public actually allocated funds are not going to do the job, okay? Uh, and so we are really in a situation in which we are faced with a some significant global crisis, which is urgent, where we really don't have time, where climate change is already upon us. As I speak, you know, there, I mean, it's temperatures which we don't even see in Delhi, are, are in Oregon, in the United States. And uh, other places are experiencing ex extreme cold. It's already happening. We are not prepared. We have not invested for adaptation at all. We haven't certainly invested in mitigation either. So we are unprepared. We are not only unprepared for something like a pandemic, but we are unable one and a half years later to respond to it with anything resembling global solidarity. So all the conditions for a global Marshall Plan unfortunately don't seem to exist in a way. The political economy of them does not seem to exist. Does it mean that then you know it's all over and we should go home and wait for the apocalypse? No. I think it is possible essentially because we really have to have much, much more significant people's pressure. Already we discover that the discussions around the global new deal, uh, there's a significant risk of takeover by big capital. They're already sniffing around looking at the profit opportunities and seeking to mold the discussion, whether at Paris or elsewhere, in ways that focus on private finance, private investment, uh, leaning in, et cetera, et cetera. All of which means what? It means that the public sector subsidizes and undertakes uh, takes over all the risks of these long-term high-risk, long gestation period investments and leaves the benefits to private capital. That's not good enough. We need a much more significant global public spending expansion. Now, G7 has already shown they can do it when they want. They can suddenly produce money out of this hat that they claimed didn't exist. So it's possible for certain urgent things. Now, what do we need therefore? Well, let me put the vision and then say how we can think of achieving it. First of all, as I've been saying, it's not just green. We have to be multicolored in the approach. And let me identify at least four colors. Green, of course, it's not just climate change, it's the broader desecration of the environment. But within the environment, I really want to focus on another color blue for water, because we have been ignoring this uh, for too long. And in China, that certification is proceeding, I, I forget how many hundreds of kilometers per day. In India, we are facing massive, massive problems in terms of water. Water wars will probably become the new wars of the 21st century, not oil anymore, because we're moving to greener energy sources. Uh, purple, the color of care economy. The pandemic should have shown us the significance of this. Unfortunately, it hasn't. Unfortunately, we still undervalue care. We're still not investing enough publicly in care. We have to remember that care is also hugely employment generating and brings about massive multiplier effects in terms of bubbling up of economic activity. And across the world, we're under investing in care. And it has to be read. It has to be redistributive, which is part of the as aspect of financing it. There are many ways to finance, not least of which include simple rules on global taxation that would enable multinationals to just pay the same rate that local companies are paying. That's all that is being asked. And yet this is being fought tooth and nail, including by G7 governments. And this is not opposed by people in the G7 because they're not aware of the issues. I'm sure the average citizen in the US or the European Union or Japan would also be outraged 
if they knew how their governments are enabling multinational corporations and the extremely wealthy to get away without paying not just their fair share of tax, but any tax practically in many cases, and certainly much, much less than local companies and ordinary citizens. Similarly, there, there is a possibility for much greater imaginative use of multilateral finance through SDRs. I know that the GDP Center also talks a lot about the possibility of recycling uh, SDRs, but we really have to have a much bigger, bolder vision coming from the countries that have surplus reserves and can spend their extra additional money that they will get into these big things like a global public investment fund, like a fund that will immediately fund COVAX enough to enable vaccination across the world, like the expansion of production facilities for not just vaccines, but essential therapeutics and other things everywhere. A global social protection fund. There are many, many things that could be done if there's a vision. Okay, so how do we do it? How, how does this, how can this happen? I really do believe that a lot of this occurs because enough people in the world, not just in the developed world, but even in the developing world, are really not aware of how much is being, shall we say, slimily pushed through by lobbying powers of corporations that have therefore access that most people don't. And how many people are simply not informed of how much they're losing because of this. So it's not just a pandemic that is never going to get resolved if you do not do this globally. It is the issue of climate change, which let's face it, you cannot resolve at a national level. But the fact that enough individuals across the world do not know of what can be done quite easily, what is not being done, and how both public spending and regulation are being shifted in a way that is redistributing once again to the already wealthy. I think that's really the, the way in which we can force change. We cannot force change by appealing to the, you know, the better nature of governments. Governments do things when they're forced to do things, but people have to force them and people have to know enough to force them. So I'm really happy GDP Center is doing all this excellent research because I think it's a very important part of that task, but it's not enough. We need to spread that word much more, thanks. Thank you so much, Shaid. What a great way to, to uh, end the initial thoughts of very realistic, um, clear-eyed view of where we are, where we need to be, and how we get there. Uh, I'll start with a round of questions that are both from me and from folks who've come up from the in the Q&A button. I want to encourage everyone again to please feel free to go to that Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and type in a question for our panelists. Do introduce yourself in that Q&A though, because otherwise we won't know who's asking that question. And it'll be harder for us to really address your underlying concerns, which we, we hope to be able to incorporate in a rich discussion. So I'll start uh, with a question that I have for Salim, which actually came up in the Q&A button as well. Um, what I want to talk more about political economy, which you brought up uh, very wisely in your comments and which uh, commenters in the Q&A have also brought up. Can you uh, entertain us for a few moments on envisioning what healthy competition would look like in its best case scenario in Africa? Uh, what is the best case scenario for healthy competition in an African reality in which BRI and B3W both exist? And, and how do policymakers, uh, both inside Africa and outside of Africa, best take advantage of this moment to extract the best <laughs> that that best case scenario, rather than have it devolve into these terms we've also heard in the geopolitical realm, like a new Cold War and other and and other frameworks that will end up uh, leaving countries in the middle uh, trampled rather than than built up. Um, for Cecilia, I'd like to uh, ask a question that came up in the Q and A, which is, can healthy competition keep us at one point five degrees? Do you think? Like, is there a way to? Like, even in the best case scenario, are we talking about a situation in which we stay within we stay within 1.5 candidly? And if not, what needs to change? And for Jayati, I'd like to ask uh, two questions, one mine and one from the, the Q&A. Um, you mentioned the importance of care work and I'm so glad you brought that into this discussion. We're talking about rebuilding after a global pandemic and it can't be more important to keep that at the center of our discussion. But Realistically speaking, um, the B3W is focused around 
incentives for private corporations to invest overseas, as you say, and they the incentives for uh, appropriately supporting care work. Uh, I don't really see them there in the in, in the incentive functions for private international investors. The BRI is, as we say, South South cooperation, but often among finance ministries in developing countries to who plan projects together. And care work is also inadequately represented in those discussions. So neither one of these frameworks particularly prioritizes care work. How can we best center that in an economic revitalization strategy that recognizes that a new Marshall Plan needs to be both green, blue, and purple, as, as you say? So let's take that round of questions, if you don't mind. And again, let me encourage all of our attendees to contribute at uh, your questions and answers in the Q&A button at the bottom of our screen. Thank you so much. Um, let me uh, kick off with uh, just one or two remarks because uh, uh, give the other speakers an opportunity. Uh, I mean, I think uh, the political economy of finance, uh, the architecture of finance is largely driven by a, a concept of, of um, uh, the nature in which uh, uh, dominant, uh, particularly the liberal economies, perceive uh, the role of state and, and the role of the of, of the private market, and preference is given to the private market, and that's that's a political economy that has to change if um, uh, the role of the public is is to add more value uh, to the broader society in order to be able to create a more inclusive economy. Um, uh, uh, in in the case of the African context, I think. Um, the mere presence of China is actually uh, allowing a, 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 a traditionally countries that have been had an asymmetric relations with great powers uh, to bring rebalance uh, uh, to some extent uh, uh, the, the relationship uh, with great great powers. In, in this case, in, in fact, the European Union, and you can see the difficulty the European Union is having in negotiating the new partnership for Africa between Europe and Africa, largely because the unspoken reason for that is actually the presence of China on the continent. Um, in fact, uh, I would say that the Europeans haven't uh, haven't thoroughly grasped the uh, the changes that have happened uh, in the last ten years. That they negotiate on premises that are still the conventional, uh, if you want, uh, pre-colonial, post-colonial sort of ideas of, of how uh, to think about Africa and the role of Africa in relationship to, to Europe. So that competition, I think, is, is changing some level, um, rebalancing the asymmetry. It's not entirely uh, symmetrical, uh, but it's providing the African countries an opportunity to really think about a common unified strategy. And that's also busy happening under the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is an attempt uh, to really try to break uh, the attempt, in this case of the Euro European uh, Union, to create sub-regional free trade uh, approaches to effectively divide and conquer the African continent uh, through, dif uh, through differentiated trade policies. And that, the Continental Free Trade Agreement is a, is a way of actually trying to take a one unified position uh, in, in the way Africans negotiate uh, at least trade policy and benefits uh, to Africa, and largely driven by the need for greater interregional trade and also uh, regional development, uh, uh, a concrete uh, a form of developmentalism that is regionally orientated and, and focus on greater industrial capability and manufacturing. So that's where they want to go. And I think uh, the game is changing, the, the rebalancing is happening because of the competition. Uh, and also it's some way of breaking the asymmetry that exists in that political economy that used to exist before. Thank you, Salim. Uh, should we go continue in the order that, that speakers presented? Cecilia, do you wanna talk about the candid prospects of 1.5? I should also mention that uh, we unfortunately have a shortened event today. And so our Q&A session will only last through 9.30. So do get your questions in and hopefully we'll be able to have one more round after this. So can healthy competition be a part of a 1.5 degree scenario? That is difficult to answer. Um, I do, have hope that competition 
in the private sector on developing renewable energy technologies can be done in a more healthy way. Um, so, you know, we hear a lot about uh, solar panels from China, dumping, trade wars, things like that. Um, you know, I think that uh, from the U.S. perspective, the U.S. also being a strong player in renewable energy technology deployment and manufacturing, um, that there could be ways, depending again on political will, to shift this towards healthy competition rather than the trade war narrative. But um, and perhaps also equally as importantly, the development finance that China and the US are providing can and is uh, shifting fairly quickly away from coal and fossil fuels uh, towards renewable energy. And so I think that there should be a, you know, a parallel private and public mobilization of uh, finance for renewable energies. Um, I also think that there are some positive examples of climate cooperation, especially from the Obama era on uh, clean energy technologies that um, may have flown under the radar through sort of more track two expert exchanges and uh, technology exchanges. Um, there were the clean energy research centers focusing on green buildings, um, energy efficiency, things like that. So it, it, it can happen. It just doesn't become a part of the more widely discussed uh, narrative um, and would also, of course, help you know, the world get on a 1.5 degree track. I also think that at this point in time, the West and the US can also learn from China, uh, not only about technology, which can be a bit more heated and competitive, but about policy design. Um, so China, you know, is launching a national carbon market, whereas the US has, you know, regional and state level initiatives, but has never, um, for various reasons, managed to have a national level emissions trading program. So I think we can learn from China a lot about uh, policy design and regulation that can reduce emissions. Um, and of course, you know, there are also the opposite is true. I think um, one uh, type of policy that uh, the Europe and the US have been pioneering is green public procurement, um, where government purchasing, which is often for infrastructure and carbon intensive materials does represent a significant percentage of GDP, uh, around 12 to 15% in a lot of Western countries. Um, and by establishing carbon intensity standards um, can help actually redirect, uh, you know, trade and manufacturing towards lower carbon intensity materials. And, um, you know, that's something that China will need to be paying attention to as demand for such carbon intensive materials is um, shifting to have actual standards for green production. Um, so I think there are rooms for opportunity on policy design, even if the question about, you know, clean technologies uh, is rather oriented towards competition right now. Yeah, well, should I go, Rebecca? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I also just want to pick up a little bit on this whole healthy competition thing. You know, a great power rivalries can be expensive, complicated, unpleasant for the great powers. But let's think of how they affect the rest of the world. And, you know, the great development economist Tandika Mukandawire from uh, Malawi, he once told me that it's always good to have competing imperialists, you know, because you can actually negotiate better conditions yourself. And he gave several interesting examples. He gave, he mentioned the fact that uh, G7 aid and uh, interest in Africa had been shifting away from providing infrastructure and much more towards whatever was the development fad of the season, you know, microfinance, cash transfer, whatever. The entry of China, the fact that China was actually providing finance for infrastructure made them change. And now you've got much more infrastructure development in the form of foreign aid from the G7 countries than you got before. Many other examples. But the point is that for the rest of the world, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have competing powers. Uh, and in fact, the, uh, shall we say, the stranglehold of hyper-imperialism has not been a particularly great time for much of the developing world. So I think the possibility of alternative uh, sources of finance and alternative sources of policy design, as Cecilia mentioned very, very importantly, I think these are all to the good. And it's, I think it's, it's quite interesting when you read the, the uh, statements of G7, how, how terribly upset they are at competition. 
when everything else is always about more competition is better, except for intellectual property, of course. But suddenly now they don't like competition, which I think is an interesting point. To get to your question, Rebecca, um, you know, that I believe is one of the major flaws of all of the, the new initiatives around green deals, Marshall plans, what have you. I'm not a big fan of the term build back better because I don't want to build back. I think what was there before was a disaster and was leading us to, let's face it, ultimately planetary extinction, quite apart from being very unequal and being unhealthy and all of the other things that we now know. So I don't want to build back, no. I want to build differently. And that building differently necessarily means you have to move away from a very simplistic uh, notion of infrastructure as being only physical infrastructure. Uh, too much of uh, both policy thinking and economic thinking has been around physical infrastructure as the means to growth, expansion, you know, all of the other benefits that you want. And of course, it's important. There's no question about it. But the role of social infrastructure has been hugely ignored. And again, when people talk about social infrastructure, then they get into all the other, forgive my saying so, claptrap about institutions, governance, etc. It's not about that. Social infrastructure is about providing basic facilities for social functioning. And that is that includes health, education, access to nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. All of the range of things which make human life viable and slightly better. We do not put enough emphasis on that. And both the B3W and the BRI are guilty on this front. Once again, I think it's because they can get away with it. States do what they can get away with. And because the discourse has been so much around growth results from physical infrastructure spending, and therefore we want growth, all of that we know is no longer viable. If we want a greener recovery, we have to think of recoveries that involve human beings, generate employment, improve the quality of life. And you cannot do that without massive multiple time increases in care or investment. And public investment is the only way to do it. The private sector is not going to do it. Let's face it. There are massive externalities. There are massive differences between social and private rates of return. And anyway, we don't want people to pay unaffordable amounts for care. So we have to do this through public expenditure, and it has to become an essential part of any new financing and any new strategies for the future, whatever we want to call them. Just one, if I can take up one issue that I noticed in the question, which I think is very important. Somebody asked about how do we maintain or get back on the track of 1.5 degrees increase in temperature? We can't. I don't know how, how many of you have been following the melting of the Arctic. It's happening at five times the pace that the scientists predicted, five times. Please, let's just think of what that means. That means that, first of all, you know how everybody thought climate change is first going to affect the tropical and subtropical regions. So as usual, most developing countries are going to be in, in it deeply and most affected. That's true. But this rate of Arctic melt does many, many things. It changes the Gulf Stream movements. It causes much higher rises in sea levels in the north, in all the places where we, we are currently sitting, in Europe, in North America. These things are going to have huge impact, which are going to be visible in the next couple of years. So I don't think we are even scraping the surface of what climate change means right now. We are, we are in for things that we have not even contemplated. So 1.5 degrees, forget about that. It's not going to happen. But we need much more urgent action on both adaptation and mitigation. The focus has all been on mitigation rather than adaptation, but the ad we're going to adapt because my God, it's already happening. And that really means I go back to the issue of urgency. And you will not do this with private. If you're going to use private, you have to put huge conditions on their activities. Unfortunately, the whole pattern of public-private partnerships has been you give them money, you give them incentives, and you do not put conditions on what they do, whether in finance or in environment or in anything else. I think we absolutely have to have much more stringent conditionalities on private companies for any kind of public support.
Thank you very much. Now we only have a few minutes left. So I'm gonna to try to coalesce a bunch of the questions in the Q&A window into two major themes that I'm gonna ask each of you to weigh in on briefly before we tie up our session together. There are two major themes emerging in the Q&A on multilateral efforts and on how civil society can engage with those efforts. Now, anyone who has been studying the reforms in the multilateral sphere over the last 30 or 40 years knows the importance of transnational civil society networks in pressuring multilateral bodies to not only green, but also blue and also focus on uh, public input and prioritizing communities. Uh, and so these two questions are, of course, intrinsically linked. Johannes Schroden from the E3G network uh, asks about the role of multilateral development banks here, because, of course, we know that development banks, part of their function is incentivizing private investors to invest in markets that may not be profitable or, or, or attractive yet. So what role for MDBs in this sphere? Uh, Tim Sweeney asks specifically Salim about the role of the African Union and whether they can be uh, productive in this, in this space. Uh, he also asks, um, and, and many other comment questioners also are asking the same thing, uh, what can be done to change the mindset and approach of investors at MDBs or through shareholder activism or through uh, political activism? Um, Rick Rowden from the Global Financial Integrity at American University specifically asks, what should people in the US be pushing the Biden administration? And I'll extend that and say multilateral development banks and institutions that are based here. One could ask the same question about uh, colleagues in Europe uh, with European-based institutions and European-based actors. Um, and William Janis at Fordham Law School asks about how we can best integrate all of these multilateral um, and bilateral approaches, the Blue Dot Network, the 5G Clean Network, these other networks that have been suggested. Uh, if I could ask you each to just weigh in for just a few minutes and then we'll wrap up. Thank you so much. Do you want me to go first? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to do justice to all the questions, but um, uh, I think that uh, the most important point here is that uh, the role of multilateral development banks and, and other sort of uh, Bretton Woods institutions, et cetera, uh, there is a significant need to look at the entire architecture of, of these multilateral development banks and the nature in which uh, the financing models work. Uh, I think it was telling when uh, BlackRock's uh, uh, I think it was Lloyd Frink, basically argued that multilateral development banks should play a bigger role to enable private sector finance uh, uh, to put in trillions of dollars of money into infrastructure. And that's only because uh, 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 private equity firms can make huge returns in emerging economies, something like 16 to 18% uh, returns. Uh, in South Africa, we're having a debate about climate finance and uh, the question the South Africans ask is, why do, does this have to be, if you want us to phase out coal, why do you need to give us concession? Uh, why does it have to be concessionary when you can just give out grants? Uh, if you worried about net zero or climate change, and if you want to bring down your carbon emissions, uh, and you want us to take off coal, which is uh, vital to the economies of, of South Africa and so on, uh, put it out in the form of grants rather than loans. Uh, and let's see whether you could put uh, your money where your mouth is. So they, these are some of the debates uh, that, that I think are, are important. Uh, but let me leave it at that. This is a very complex uh, debate and, and argument. Uh, thank you, Salim. Yes, these are much more complicated questions than we could possibly get at to in just a few minutes. And I wish we could all sit around um, and have lunch afterwards together, or have dinner afterwards together and discuss this at great length. Uh, unfortunately, we are so limited in time that I'll ask Cecilia and Jayati to go, to go ahead and answer these as well within the time limits. Thank you. <laughs> 
I just want to pick up briefly on the question of how to change the mindset of uh, investors. I won't get into how to change the minds of politicians, but I think that, you know, as far behind as, as policy and government are in achieving the 1.5 degree target, um, they're still often ahead of the decisions of the, the private sector and the financial sector. And I think that one uh, major thing that needs to be done is the communication of the financial impacts of a lot of the risks that we've talked about today, the climate risk, both in terms of transition and stranded assets, as well as the physical risk to infrastructure, um, but also the risks to um, the land that a lot of these uh, physical infrastructure projects are being built on. So um, as governments are increasingly moving to protect their forests, um, and to protect indigenous areas, any development in that area is also at risk of becoming a stranded asset. And so I think that there are steps towards making the financial sector aware of the full uh, potential impacts of their supply chain. But I think there's still a lot that needs to be done in terms of communicating, collecting and communicating uh, that information as a way to really shift decision making on the part of the financial sector, which would of course uh, be huge in terms of where their projects are located and the types of projects that they're investing in. Thank you, Cecilia. Jayati? Thank you. You know, I'm going to focus on Rick's question because I think it's extremely relevant and nice to not see you, Rick, but at least be in touch indirectly. What can people in the US push the Biden administration on? And by the way, many of these things people in Europe could push their governments on as well. I would mention five important areas. One is the whole issue of global taxation. The agreement that the G20 has been pushed into, G7 agreed on and G20 has been pushed into, gives a minimum global tax rate of 15%. It's a joke. That's the tax rate close to the tax havens of Ireland and the Netherlands and so on. It should be at least 21%. And the US, by declaring its own, can actually push it. The US should also drop the arbitration clause, which has been pushed into this tax deal, that forces developing country governments into international arbitration with private companies, which is going to be deadly. And it was a clause inserted by private lobbies. It has to be removed. The second critical area of act, and these are all low hanging fruit. They don't really cost very much for the US. Uh, vaccines. The, the Biden administration still has export bans on some crucial inputs for the production of vaccines. Obviously, that has to go. They still do not push. I mean, they've agreed to stop the waiver uh, protest in the trips, but they still are not pushing their government companies to share technology, which they can easily do. They pushed Johnson & Johnson to share with Merck. You can push your companies that benefited from public funds to put the technology open access in the WHO CTAP. So second important area. And third, COVAX. It's hugely underfunded. It needed 26 billion this year, it's got 6.2 billion. The rest of it would not even be a drop in the ocean of the fiscal spending of the US. I mean, nobody would notice it. 20 billion is nothing in the US nowadays. I mean, it's, it's being tossed around like peanuts, right? So absolutely these three areas immediately fund COVAX. Third area, debt relief, cancel all the bilateral debt using your share of SDRs, right? It's almost cost, I mean, all you're paying is that 0.02% interest or something. So just cancel all the bilateral debt of the US and encourage the multilaterals also to cancel their debt, preferably using your SDRs, which you are never going to use. So that can easily be done without really any fiscal cost, any issues. And fourth, lean on the multilateral financial institutions. We all know the US has a disproportionate role there to stop enforcing the bad conditionalities. Well, Rick has done a lot of work on this. He knows in full detail, but we know that they are still enforcing the most terrible conditions that reduce public spending, public employment, health spending in developing countries and force them to keep paying debt service. And finally, bring in more conditions on private companies including in the US, not just for their own investments within the US and force them to be green, but on debt and bond financing by US financial players globally. They are still encouraging coal investments, all kinds of brown investments, all kinds of environmental deregulation. So bring in more regulations on debt and bond financing and on multinationals, US multinationals abroad. 
Thank you. As they say, I always leave them wanting more. And I feel like I, I wish we could continue this conversation literally for hours upon hours. Uh, one more question that has been bubbling up from many different voices in the Q&A uh, tells me that everybody else here wants more also. People are asking in a variety of ways, where can I learn more about all of these issues? What, what's one website? where I could go to and learn about all of these issues. So first, of course, I have to plug the GDP Center. In the chat, you'll find a link to subscribe to our updates, as well as a link to the YouTube recording of this event, where, of course, you can also see all of the other events that we have recorded on our YouTube channel. But I'd like to also ask if there's one source that Celine, Cecilia, Jayoti, that you recommend that uh, our attendees go to uh, to, have to start learning more about these issues. We'll have one lightning round. Of, of websites or books, and, and then we'll close out. If I can just quickly say, I've put it into the chat already. Uh, I'm involved in an international association of development economists from the global south. So if you want a south perspective on any of these issues, www.networkideas.org. It's in the chat as well. Thank you. Cecilia? Um, I personally really enjoy the website China Dialogue for up-to-date news on uh, China's uh, um, overseas investment in the environment as well as domestic issues. Um, I would also make a plug for BU's uh, China's Overseas Development Finance Database, CODF. Uh, the link is uh, also in the chat, I believe, um, for a lot of the work that I was discussing about where uh, Chinese projects are overlapping with um, protected areas. Um, Thank you. And Salim. Yeah, I have I follow many, but uh, you know, I also have uh, what this group called the CG Dev. I, I can't always remember the Center for Growth and Development. This is really good website and many, many other ones, but uh, people can contact me if they if they need to. Thank you so much, everyone. Again, thank you to all of our panelists and to all of our attendees. Uh, I encourage you to stay in touch with us. I hope this is the beginning of a rich discussion moving forward and coordinating all of these rich ideas. Uh, stay in touch with us on, uh, on our website and on our YouTube channel and on social, social media for additional